Tonight will be on the law. I think you'll find it a very practical evening. But remember, you are the offering power. It doesn't operate itself. But all day long, whether you know it or not, you are operating it. Nothing appears to us in perception which cannot be duplicated in fantasy. Consequently, the world perceives always resembles our private fantasy and is therefore, as far as the evidence goes, imaginal in character. So here we are trying to find the cause of the phenomena of life. What makes things happen? Why is that one poor and that one rich? Why is that one known and the other unknown? And why is one this and the other that? And yet we are told in scripture there is only one cause, only one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. We aren't two gods, there's only one God. So we have to find out who this one God is. If I should speak to you now and say, and speak of your God, the chances are, and you can give it any number you want, a million in one, or trillions in one, that hearing the word your God, that your mind will instantly think of someone or something external to yourself. I do not hear how you form it, but you will think of God, your God, as external to yourself. But if I spoke of your imagination, I am certain you will think of no one but yourself. Could it be that your imagination is the God of Scripture? If you read Scripture carefully, you will find that it is. There is only one creative power. We are told in the 32nd chapter of the book of Deuteronomy that I, even I, am He. And there is no God beside me. I kill, I make alive, I wound, I heal. And there is none that can be delivered out of my hand. From this we see that the creative power of the world, the creator of the world, is like pure imagining in ourselves. He works in the very depths of our soul, underlying all of our faculties, including perception that he streams into our surface life, least disguised in the form of productive fancy. For you see anything here through your senses, shut your eyes, close your senses completely, and you can reproduce it in fancy. Does it teach me anything? Well, I'll tell you, it will teach you everything if you believe it. If I can get you to accept the true God, the only true God, which is your own wonderful human imagination. Does scripture teach it will? Yes, scripture does. And the word of the Lord, well, the word translated Lord, is the Hebrew yod hey vav hey. It's not Sunday. So we do tighter sound, it can be translated as the Lord, and sometimes Jehovah, and sometimes we'll translate it, which they shouldn't, say as God, but the Lord, yes. The word Jehovah, yes. Well, the word Jesus begins yod he -Vav. So here we find the same root in the word Jesus. Therefore, they call him the Lord. 
And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Arise, and go down to the potter's house, and I will let you hear my word. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, working at his wheel, and the vessel in his hand was spoiled that he was making a play. But he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to him to do. Well, the word potter, using in terms of a man, I know in little Barbados where I was born, I would go up to the potter's field. And there he was, working these things out of play. Things where we put the normal water into it, and in some strange way, it chilled it. It would always depend upon a nice cold, cold glass of water. It poured from what we call the monkey. It was a thing made of clay, had a little clay top, and an open thing like a huge big teapot. But made of clay, in the hottest moment of the day, if you poured it from that clay, it was always nice and cold. And so, I could see him now form the entire thing with his hand. But in scripture, the word potter means imagination. You'll find what I've just quoted in the 18th chapter of the book of Jeremiah. You'll also find it in the 64th chapter of the book of Isaiah. Though what our father, our potter, who is the father? Well, the Lord. Well, the true translation of the word Lord, which is yod hey valfe is I am. And if I should go to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers sent me unto you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say? Say to them, I am. That is who I am. Say to them, I am has sent me unto you. Not the Lord has sent me unto you, or Jehovah has sent me unto you, or Jesus has sent me unto you. For these always takes the mind outside of self. But say to them, I am has sent me unto you. You want to know his name? Just say, I am that is who I am. That is my name forever. And by this name I shall be known throughout all generations. But man will not bring himself to believe that that is God. He will not bring himself to believe that his own wonderful human imagination is God. And that is God. That forms everything in this world. There is the thing that you now see in the world, but what it was once only imagined. The image preceded the objective fact. So objective reality is purely produced through imagining. The suit you wear, the dresses you wear, the chairs on which you were seated, the building that now houses you, everything was only imagined. And then it became an objective reality. And we think the objective state is its reality. And it's not so at all. That which is the imaginative image is its reality. Destroy the objective fact. I can reproduce it from the imaginative image. It is all within us. Our own wonderful human imagination is the God of Scripture. Now we are told, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world knew him not. So you walk the earth, as the cause of the phenomena of your life. 
you could be, if you are vivid in your imagination, be influencing the imaginations of unnumbered people, and you unseen by them are the cause of the phenomena of life. If they are passive, they fall under your influence. If you are powerful in your imagination, you are creating the phenomena of life. And those who are not in control of their imagination who are moved by the wind of every little rumor, every opinion, they simply sway from side to side as you in control move them. You are the one treading in the wine press. And no one knows it. You could be in a dungeon serving a long, long span of time. And while there, eaten up with a desire, and then in your silent moment, you are completely in control of that vivid, creative power of the universe, your imagination. And you influence all the people of the world. For all things by a law divine, in one another means mingle. I couldn't see you if you did not penetrate my brain. I couldn't. I couldn't hear you if you didn't penetrate it. So all things by a law divine in one another's being mingled. The whole vast world is one. You in control of the creative power, which is your own wonderful human imagination, you can sway the entire vast world. If you can't do it, as some dictators have tried to do it, they bring in their propaganda machine. And then they try to force man into a certain shell, into a certain and quite often they succeed up to a point. But you, without the aid of any machine in this world, you can change the structure of your world by the control of your own wonderful human imagination. That is God. That is the Lord spoken of in Scripture. That is Jesus. Or well, can you imagine? For well, that is God in operation. God only acts and is in existing beings or men. But how does he act? As I imagine. I imagine anything. See now that I, even I, am he. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. And none can deliver out of my hand. Raise my hand to heaven and cry, I live forever. That's the immortal you, it cannot die. When you say I am, it cannot die. It's not confined to the little garment that you're wearing. That's a mask that you put upon yourself that you will be seen in this world of shadows. But you are not the mask that you wear. You are an immortal being and that immortal being is God the Father I've spoken of in scripture, but I would like you to begin to feel it is simply I am. And by that, imagination. You can sit down this very moment and begin to dream the most glorious dream in the world concerning yourself. At the moment of the dream, reason denies it. Your senses deny it. But if you dare to assume that assumption, that you are already that in its fullness, and persist in that assumption, it will harden into fact. Look that I met Isaiah and Ezekiel, and I dined with them last night. And I say to Isaiah, do you really believe that an assumption will harden into fact? He said, all prophets believe that it does, but today not very many are capable of an assumption of anything. They change from moment to moment. If I could dare to assume that I am what at the moment reason denies and persists in my assumption in a way that I do not know and I need not be concerned about, it will actually find the necessary means to externalize itself within my will. That I know from experience, and scripture teaches it from beginning to end. 
this is the law that came after the promise. The promise came first, and that is irrevocable. No one can fail in the fulfillment of the promise. You will awaken one day as God himself, and you will know it. That is the promise. But while we are moving through this veil of tears, we have a law, and the law is the law of assumption. If I dare to believe that what I have said will come to pass, and not question it, well, go your way, it will come to pass.